What a week it's been. Every day seemed to bring more and more daunting news about this coronavirus, this outbreak. Conferences are being canceled left and right. Mark, March break plans seem to be falling apart for many people. Israeli relatives, I know, are afraid to leave the country to attend family simchas here in Toronto and throughout the world because if they leave Israel, they're afraid they might not be let back in, depending on where they've been. You may have heard in the Jewish press that three Jewish day schools in Westchester County have been closed. And today I read an article written by one Orthodox rabbi there in Westchester who's announced that he himself has been diagnosed with coronavirus. Synagogues in Seattle and other hot spots are, closed, are closing. They're announcing, colleagues of mine have announced that they're closing for a couple of weeks, that services, pre-recorded services, will be available on their website for people to uh, follow along on Shabbat and Purim. Some are, have shut down their carnivals and their Purim celebrations. And what about here, close to home, I heard this afternoon that the number has increased to four people who have been diagnosed in our city of Toronto. They're all in their homes, being treated in their homes, so we shouldn't be afraid to go to hospitals when needed. And you may have heard, as I did, about uh, one of those 14 people um, has identified which routes he took on the subway, on the TTC, and so those cars are being treated disinfected. And so our mayor is calling for vigilance and calm. Vigilance and calm. And it's hard to know when to worry and when not to worry. How much to worry, how little to worry. And I know there's some physicians here tonight and uh, people are probably asking you every day, every hour of every day, how much do we worry? I know I asked my sister who's who's a doctor. How much should I worry? Well, just moments ago, we offered up the Hashki Venu prayer. And it goes like this. Shield us from hatred and plague. Shield us from hatred and plague. That word plague sounds like long ago and far away. Um, but it's, it's right here and, and relevant for our prayers tonight. I'll share one story with you. Um, Jesse, my youngest son and I, were um, around town and he asked for a Tim Hortons run and I can never deny him. And I hadn't had lunch, so I got for myself a toasted sesame bagel with light cream cheese. And we got into the car and we started munching. And I didn't tell you this, Jesse, but as I'm munching, I'm asking myself, if I knew that the young man behind the counter was Persian and that his uncle just got back from a visit to Tehran, would I be biting into this bagel right now? I don't know. There's so much we don't know. And we are so dependent on one another. We are so interconnected, all of us, all of humanity, a single interdependent family. If we ever doubted that, we are all in it together. If we ever doubted that we sink or swim together, this latest plague is a very effective teacher. There is uh, a scene that comes from the Talmud where the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is training young priests. And they're on the Temple Mount um, at, at the, the steps that were designed specifically for the Kohanim. And they're looking at the marketplace where all the hustle and bustle is and all the interactions and all the um, uh, bartering and negotiating and uh, the noise of animals and sellers and buyers. And the young Kohanim were commenting on how that scene is so different from the scene that they enjoy in the chambers of the temple where all is sacred and all is calm and all is shalom. 
And the Kohen Gadol scolded them and he said, we depend on this scene of the marketplace. The priestly clothes that you are wearing, where do you think the wool came from? Where do you think the dyes came from? And when we take the, uh, the sacrifices to be offered, where do you think those goats and those sheep come from? We depend on the farmers and we depend on the weavers. And when we use the instruments for the sacrifices, where do you think those silversmiths are? They're right there in the marketplace. And we depend on them in every way. So last week, um, members of the congregation received a notice from our executive director, Ron Polster, letting us know of new common sense protocols for temple life. If you're sick, stay home. Wash your hands. Don't shake hands. Don't do the kissy-huggy thing we usually do on Shabbat. There are Purell stations throughout the building now, you know. We've arranged for servers so that at the Kiddush lunch, uh, everyone can receive their food rather than helping themselves directly. And even reaching out to the Torah for a kiss or reaching out to a mezuzah for a kiss, uh, those pleasures will, will just um, take a break for the time being. All this leads to an isolating effect. There can be anxiety induced by reminders of these new practices. And loneliness and anxiety, of course, are also unhealthy. So what do we learn from our sages? One more Talmudic tale. There was a time when the plague known as Ra'atan was going around. It was very contagious and very dangerous. I have no idea what a modern scientist might tell us Ra'atan was. Its symptoms are described in the Talmud that um, someone's eyes become very teary and um, their nose is very runny and their mouth is filled with saliva and then also one detail that flies are nearby. So it sounds like something really unpleasant. And so the rabbis suggest treating ratan with certain herbs and certain plants um, that would be some kind of medicine. And then they describe um, that eventually there would be a particular surgery to treat ratan. And then there are a number of rabbis who describe what they do and don't do when they know of someone in their town with Ra'atan. So Rabbi Yochanan issued an announcement. Beware of the flies that may come from an infected person with Ra'atan. And Rabbi Ze'ira says that you should never sit downwind from someone who suffers with Ra'atan. And Rabbi Elazar says that you should not go into the tent of someone with Ra'atan. And Rabbi Ami and Rabbi, Rabbi Asi say that they never ate the eggs that came from a particular row in the marketplace uh, where someone with Ra'atan lived. And then comes one more line, and it's the last line. And usually in Talmudic discourse, the last line is the line with the punch. So Rabbi Yehoshua son of Levi, suggested that we should hug those with Ra'atan and we should study Torah with those who suffer Ra'atan. So of course we want to be health, healthy and safe and we should follow all the protocols that come not just from Holy Blossom Temple because what do we know but from the official websites now that are available uh, throughout the country including travel advisories, so you can check the, the government websites for up-to-date uh, recommendations for how to stay safe, safe and healthy. And of course, we want to keep our loved ones safe and healthy. But I do want to call up Rabbi Yoshua Ben Levi and his teaching as well, because he came uh, from the third century, from Lida, from Lod, which is where today's uh, Ben Gurion Airport is, 
And he believed, on the one hand, Torah is an elixir of life. The Torah is a cure-all that would protect anyone from harm and bring healing to those who engage in the words of Torah. And so if someone had ra'atan, you should go and be nearby with words of Torah, because Torah has a healing agent, healing properties. You should not let one who suffers be um, so abandoned. And Rashi, furthermore, says about Rabbi Yoshua's approach, how do you explain it when you know Ratan is contagious? Why would Rabbi Yoshua go and study Torah with someone who suffers it? And he says, in the 11th century, he says that Torah is also protective of the healthy one, that it's a kind of vaccine that prevents transition, uh, transmission of disease. Not literally, of course, but figuratively. The Torah both has healing properties and um, uh, some kind of protective properties as well. So yes, let's wash our hands and get enough sleep and stay healthy and take care, but also uh, reach out to one another by bringing your Torah. And that could be over the phone or FaceTime or however you do it. But um, this is a time for drawing closer to one another. And I'm so glad that you came tonight, um, even without the handshaking. It feels like Shabbos. It feels like community. It feels like the, uh, the warmth and togetherness that we also need to stay healthy. Shabbat Shalom.